Hi, my name is Yanis, and today we're going to interview the founder of Go Music Solutions, Matt Myers. Matt, you have been involved in some exciting projects over the years and creating some very respected music related businesses. Today we're here to talk about your latest venture called Go Music Solutions. But first, could you tell us about your journey up to this point? I don't know where to start really, but um, I suppose, you know, being brought up, my dad was always in the music business and he did some pretty amazing things. He was a successful songwriter and um, had a couple of our Eurovision entries writing songs and um, me and my brothers were brought up little whippersnappers running around studio complexes and that from an early age, like when we were babies, you know. So our whole lives have been in studios like this. And um, fast forward to when I went to college and I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do in my life, but the rave scene kicked off um, and I started throwing parties at college basically. So that was, this is showing my age now. But that was like 1990 or 91 and rave scene just exploded and I got sucked up into it in a big way. At that time I was so 16, 15, 16. Warren, my younger brother, was like three years younger than me. And exactly the same time, he's a 13 year old kid with an eight track in his bedroom and he's learning to write songs and produce while I'm at college, meant to be doing my diploma, but I started throwing parties. And, and skip school. And skipping school. Well, my whole thing back then was, mm. I did pass my diploma, but really I spent all my time promoting events. And it started off my club nights, a couple of hundred of my college buddies to, um, promoting some pretty serious parties really. Over the next couple of years from college, it was just fun, but I went from promoting small events to a couple of hundred people to bringing many thousands of people to my Thunderground events. So that's how it all began really. My dad was like, don't get into the music business, it would kill you, it's so hard, trust me. But in another breath, he's like, I've had the best life ever. And I was brought up hearing all the stories of him and his pals, you know who've engineered the Rolling Stones and done this and done that. And I was like, I want some of that in my life. I want to be in music. And it was in my blood. But, um, and then he heard that this sort of, he, he found out one day when the head of college phoned him that I hadn't been going to college. Instead, I was getting a lift in there every day. But what he didn't know is I had a bunch of flyers in my pocket and I would go and fly all the college cars, go to all the neighboring colleges and just promote my events. And, um, Warren was sort of making tunes back then and I would I taught myself to DJ at sort of 17 years old. So I DJ at my own events and that's really how it all began. My family was like, you're living in a dream, come on, you've got to do something real. You've been to studying to be an architect and all this. And um, but soon they were hearing from my friends that no, Matt's throwing like the biggest raves around at the moment. And I suppose a couple of years later to the point that as a DJ in my own right, my family woke up a bit when I had a guest slot on Judge Jules, um, Judge and the Jury on Kiss FM, and a Radio 1 guest slot. Guest slot. And, um, and then Ministry has invited us to promote a big Christmas party there, which we did. And um, with Paul Oakenfold, Tony DeVitt, Boy George, loads of big people DJing there. And, um, the ministry it was a massive success and we went on to be made um, Ministry of Sound resident DJs for many years for decorum on the frisky nights and so I'm DJing then I'm starting to become a DJ I'm a club promoter ended up promoting lots of the clubs in England and um, at the same time parallel to that Warren's in the studio learning how to produce and write and craft songs and I was doing a bit of that too but more from a I had a vision of the club side of it, you know, what the tunes needed to be doing. And um, that's really how it all began in the sort of mid 90s, I'd say, that it all got quite serious. And I started my first company and we started, I guess I was a club promoter and a DJ. 
and Warren was doing music, but together we were on the journey then. And that all, um, that led up to the year 2000, where, you know, we um, had done amazing things in that world. I suppose going back a bit actually, simultaneously to me doing the clubs, um, and Warren doing the music, through being a DJ in all these events, like Ministry of Sound and um, Satellite Club back then, and like club, all these sort of clubs, I met a network of amazing, talented producers who were making tunes that blew my mind. And it wasn't just dance, it was pop and everything, but you know what, the, the, the underlying current that I saw running through all these guys who had their own studios, were as passionate as I was, they didn't know what to do in their music. So back then, a while back, they just had DAT tapes piling up on their shelves of material. And my dad sort of said to me, you know, you've got to do something with this. So I sort of adopted my own position within the music industry. Actually, at my college days, 17 years old really, and I started going and knocking on the doors of the major labels. I would go in the reception areas, I would just turn up and um, I'd have my bag of DAT tapes and I would get the meetings with the A&R guys and play them all my music, you know, but I was passionate. And um, so that's it, I was, I was getting into the industry, promotion, DJing, so very much an A&R thing. And Warren was being very creative in the studio and that brought us up to the year 2000, when it was a pivotal moment for us. Did you take over the world famous hit factory when you were very young? Yeah, I thought I was old at the time, but in hindsight I was just a kid, a stupid kid. And um, I was 25 years old at that point, and it was the year 2000, and that was a pivotal moment for me. Everything led towards this moment where Pete Waterman, Stock Aitken and Waterman, you know, the world famous hit factory, more hits have come out of that building than anywhere else in probably Europe, or at least the UK actually. You know, your Merlins in Europe and places like this are exceptional. But um, we took over that building. And um, but anyway, we did it properly. We gutted the hit factory and we bought it to what it is today, which is a stunning studio complex and offices. Um, and it's very prestigious and very beautiful building, which I'm very proud of. And everyone in there is, you know, music related. We've got great producers in there and um, booking agents and virtual reality companies who are doing tours for all the big artists. So it's very much a music media hub. And um, yeah, so year 2000, I took that over, but I was 25 years old and... And what did you learn from that experience? Well, when, when we moved in there, I remember my dad, who always guided me, was like, well, we should rent out that room, rent out that, and I'm just a greedy 25-year-old passionate kid. I was like, no, I don't want anyone else in here. This is us. I want the whole building, every square inch of it. I want it. And, um, and he let us have it really, and we were like, okay, we're gonna do this together. It's, just, it's a family building, we're a family company. And, um, but for like, you know, the next few years, we moved in some pop producers from Sweden, um, some great pop producers. And kind of my network of producers who I've built up through my years as being a DJ and club promoter, we said, hey, we own a great studio complex, come on in. I was a young 25 year old trying to make a name in the music industry and owning the hit factory, which we still do to this day, my family. And so I learned a big lesson on, well, people really, more than anything. Um, I started a lot of businesses in that building, in the studio complex, and as passionate young kids who just wanted to do something in the music business and um, you know, messed them all up terribly. Every company I ever started back then um, they were just, I just didn't, you know, I just, all I know is I wanted to do something great. Throughout your journey in the music in industry, is it always smooth or have you have any, like, you know, have you been through any hard time? Yeah, I think at the end of, you know, through the hit factory thing, um, um, got to 
I don't know what happened really. It was just, I learned a lot about stress. Because I was just a DJ producer, I took over this huge world famous studios and um, and I thought it would all be easy really. But you know, being a landlord and, and everything else and none of your friends are. No one else is in the same situation you are and your family. We can all kid ourselves and pretend we are, but the pressure was always on me. It was always on me personally, the pressure for everyone. And my parents and that, because it's a family business, but I was the one in there. And I learned a lot about stress. You know, I've always been, I like to feel that the one thing from day one that I've never changed, and it comes from me and my family, is I'm all about the people around me and everyone being happy, and nothing's ever changed there. I'm the eternal optimist, you know, and I love that. And fortunately, the music industry hasn't sucked that out of me like it has so many other people. But through running the hit factory and trying lots of different things, I did, you know, got to a point where I didn't know what was happening at the time, but I remember leaving the building one day, walking up to London Bridge, and I just felt something in the back of my neck. I was just holding my neck and saying to my friend, something's not right. And um, I said, take me back to the building now. And I went back to the building and it was just this feeling of like, I don't know, it was like someone had drugged me. But I hadn't done anything. I was like, um, and in hindsight, later on, months later, I found out that was like a panic attack, anxiety attack. And um, it was like a living nightmare that you couldn't wake up from. So I had that and I remember I drank a bottle of vodka, basically neat, just to try and calm my mind down because it was like this horrible panic attack, you know? In hindsight, I know what they are now. Because when you have your first bad panic attack, it opens up Pandora's box because you're living in fear of this thing that happened to you. So then you always, your flight and fight response is raised and you're always ready to have another one. And that just makes it worse. So it's the stress from working in the music industry that make you have this? I would definitely say so. I would say that it all came from um, passion. Passion for the music. And not just for me, I'd say even more so, and another thing that hasn't changed, wanting it so bad for the people around me, you know? And, yeah, that was, that's where the stress comes from. On my own, I can handle anything. But when you're someone with a big heart, whether they want you to or not, you take everyone's passion. You want it for everyone. And, um, yeah, so, that happened and I started getting panic attacks and um, the next few years I had to suffer those demons and learn about it but luckily I am um, I feel I became the master of that without any medicine or anything and it changed my life for the better 100% you have been building your current business for around seven years now with your brother Warren and your business partner Dale tell us about your current company starting with audio freaks audio freaks well, Audio Freaks is mine and Warren's baby, really, initially, at least as an idea, but goddamn, Dale is the man, really, and I'll get to that. But I guess what I didn't say at the end of this, like, the hip factory period, um, when I started getting panic attacks, it wasn't a nervous breakdown. I thought it was. It was just panic attacks and anxiety attacks, but... It scared me, especially when I was having them daily, and um, it got to a point where, uh, you know, in its worst, I didn't, I didn't sleep for five nights because I could. It's like I couldn't shut shut like, my mind down. It's just ah, anxiety, you know. And um, and during that point, which was the lowest point in my life, I basically shut myself away in my parents' house in a bedroom for three months. Had this whole empire up London, the building, everyone in there, and I couldn't even face it. So I was in my bedroom for, for like three months. No music, nothing. Barely felt like I was hanging on to my sanity back then. You know, anyone who's had panic attacks knows exactly what I mean. Um, it was being shell-shocked by this thing, which I didn't understand. Back then, no one really spoke about things like that. These days, people seem more open about stuff like that. But um, So yeah, three months, I'm thinking, okay, I can't really go up to the building. Music is destroying me. 
and does that mean this is it for me? You know, years of working in music, do I have to leave it now because I can't do it? I was just lost, totally lost. And um, so after that sort of three month, or two month, three month period that I went through, I at last managed to get back in the studio and um, up to that period I'd really blamed the music business for everything. So I hadn't even listened to any music, but I went into the studio, sort of dusted the gear down and turned on the equipment and started listening to some beats and doing what I do, going through some kick drums and stuff like that. And um, before I knew it, sort of 12 hours had passed and I'd made a tune. And something I failed to mention is that you know, I'd always been a producer, a record producer. All through my college days, always I was in the studios. My thing was learning engineering option from 16 years old. Um, so I was, you know, a mix engineer really, and a producer. Me and Warren always producing together. I made a lot of records throughout the garage days, two step under different names. Done it all, you know, and um, and that's what I really I felt. That's who I was, a record producer first and foremost. So I um, made this tune, like a house tune, inspired by Head Candy at the time, which was run by Mark Doyle. I loved all the stuff Mark was signing, I thought he was a great A&R guy, and um, Stonebridge too at the time. I made a record, and um, Warren came back from the pub that night, I was in the studio. I know Warren had been worried sick about his big brother, who he looks up to for these months, and had just worried sick, you know? And um, he came in, I was like, wow, I've made a tune. He could see the life was back in my eyes. You know, the power of music. And I felt it too. I was excited for the first time in a long time, head of a long time. And I was like, what do you think? And I played it to him. As with a lot of music, you're in there doing it all day. You might think something's great, but you're so close to it after a while, you don't actually know anymore. It's hard to be objective sometimes. But I could tell on Warren's face, he was just blown away. And then, he sat down, I was like, look, we need to do a song, we need to write something, and it just started unfolding. Warren's a great lyricist, started writing this great song, and um, he came up with the hook and wrote the verses. But I, then I remembered an old rap that he had done with his friend Paul Cope, a great rapper, um, called Hypnotic Erotic Games. But I was like, we need to bring that into this and call it Hypnotic Erotic Games. And, and that became this track, Hypnotic Erotic Games. And literally the next day, I fired it out to some radio DJs and a load of my DJ pals. And um, my phone started going off the hook. Literally, emails, phones, it went mental. And this record just blew up. Our first sort of dance record after all this period. And um, it just went bang. And that's when I knew that I was born to do that. And so was Warren and I knew I had to carry on doing the music business and doing music. And um, I was like, Sh shit, wow, this record's blowing up, we need the name now. And I was like, I want us to be called Soul Shaker. And that's how Soul Shaker was born, um, which I'm sure we get to in a minute. But um, that became our first Soul Shaker single. Um, and, but really that was the point where I was like, okay, I still need to do music business. That's what I'm born to do, that's all I know, that's always been my dream. But God damn, if we're gonna do it again, if I'm gonna do music business again, I'm gonna do it on my terms. And that was it, that was the life changing moment that led to where we are. Nothing's ever changed from that moment. My terms were, I wanna work with genuine nice people, with big hearts, a lot of passion, who are prepared to be part of a family and who are prepared to go through the hard times to get to the good times. And if the car times come again after those good times, stick with it. Stick with the family where you're safe. Great like-minded people who are just passionate and have got big hearts, like me and my family. And um, Is that how you started Audio Freaks? That's how Audio Freaks started. We were like, well, um, we need, let's start a new company. But this, let's learn through all of our mistakes and let's do it properly this time, on our terms. We're the bosses, we know how it should be done, we always know, knew how it should have been done, but this time, let's put our money where our mouth is and do it ourselves and we're steered away. And we, Warren came up with the name Audio Freaks, which I was like, 
that's appropriate for us. And um, we are a production company, first and foremost, a writing and production company. That's how it was. I've seen the biggest production and writing companies in the world emerge. I knew how they done it. Because from an early age, 16, 17, 18, I was always immersed in that world. I was a young whippersnapper running around, passionate, who they might have looked at and thought, oh, here's Matt again, who, who is he? I always knew in my mind I was gonna try and do something like that. That's what I always wanted, to build a big production company. And, um, and that, was, that was it, Audio Freaks was it. And what is um, Hit Vocals? Hit Vocals is a, one of our fairly new companies which um, we saw there was a gap in the market for we thought the quality of songs wasn't great out there to be honest and um, we thought that if we could come up with amazing songs um, working with the current sort of trends in dance music and get some great writers involved uh, and record those vocals <coughs> that we could in a sense develop what my tagline was at the time um, exclusive vocals for exclusive producers only aiming at the very A-list producers out there who are signed to major labels who are just working with hit songs or want to be and um, we started that business and that business has just flown and I've got to say it's all down to Ben Samama um, who's an amazing writer and manager of the business and um, has in six months pulled in about 30 cuts so far for our publishing company but um, I think um, so Hit Vocals is doing an amazing thing but I think going back to Audio Freaks a little bit which is our baby really um, Audio Freaks has developed into you know as a production and writing company and publishing company has um, developed into something pretty amazing now with some world-class writers and producers what about Freak Tone Records? Freak Tone Records is our, um, a dance music record label which we're distributed by I believe digital and um, it's um, building up really nicely now. It's really a vehicle we set up for Go Music Solutions, which is my new baby, um, which is a great business venture. And um, yeah, Free Tone was set up as a vehicle for that, um, for a global release platform hitting every retailer in the world. So we've got a very heavyweight in-house record label if we need to use it for certain projects. You also represent uh, clothing brands. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I suppose through all the um, the success we've had, really, which has been substantial, um, in particular under our Soul Shaker name as producers, myself and Warren um, and Gizmo, my best friend, um, we did some pretty great things. And you know, we're always producing and DJing and that. And um, then. Th we got approached by Fila to represent their 100 year anniversary of the brand and um, so we did some DJ tour stuff for the 100 year but that, that progressed into a relationship with the owner of Fila and various other brands and he realised that we got a real knowledge of the music business and knew most people involved so he in, engaged our company to start acting as um, the exclusive brand representatives for Fila and, um, and then for other clothing brands too, stemmed off that Russell Athletic, Urban Stone, a new brand called Subspecies. And that's how sort of I got into the, the brand side of the business and brand development and brands to music, which is that company that we formed um, for exactly that, bringing brands a um, global awareness within the music sector. And um, that's another area where I guess we specialize really. And Galactic Studios? Galactic Studios, which is where we are now, and um, which is how this video started, a tour of our studios, was um, just an amazing opportunity, really, um, that came together working, you know, a friend, very good friend of ours, Tony Adams, a great guy, sort of used to follow me and Warren around on our music exploits around the world, and um, owned a warehouse here, running one of his other businesses, and he just it got to the point through some of his businesses he'd had a lot of success too that together we were like you know let's use that space and it was really his vision um, but he was like let's 
turn this into another studio complex. So we were all behind it. And it being stemming off our main company, Galactic Media Group, which is our mother company with a group of companies underneath. Um, we thought it made sense to call it Galactic Studios. And, and Galactic Studios now is for recording studios with lovely offices and sleeping facilities, rehearsal rooms. And it is becoming, I guess, the big buzz studio in the UK at the moment. Uh, where all the major acts are coming, flying in from around the world, and um, it's early days, you know, this year really, we only started in January, and our first project was um, being the music directors uh, for the big reunion, and so we had all the big reunion acts in here daily, now we're looking at big reunion series two, aside from that, just, you know, typical major record label acts and that coming in here, and all our audio freaks teams working on a daily basis, so this is Galactic Studios place we're very proud of and it's really thanks to Tony Adams. Just me and you, like a new partner in crime And we can roll like Scooby-Doo, any place or any time We can lock down a rendezvous, now I got you by my side There ain't nothing that we can't do Do you want to talk more about Audio Freaks? <clears throat> yeah, Audio Freaks, I guess, really is my baby, you know, and um, that was what started this main part of our adventure in music business, and um, we're so proud of what it's doing. I think Audio Freaks as a writing production and publishing company um, has become now what is currently, somehow, being respected globally as one of the big writing and production companies and publishing companies. Um, we're getting cuts around the world. Our writers and producers who are seriously head and shoulders with any other major writer and producer in the world are just exceptional and you know I won't even list them all in case I miss someone off but we've got kind of 10 exclusively signed writing and production teams in Audio Freaks who are all getting cuts around the world, doing amazing things, and you know, I'll put any one of our writers, producers, in with Max Martin or Dr. Luke or any of them, any day, and know that they'll represent fully 
and they are. So I think Audio Freaks has become a very big buzz at the moment. I think that um, there's the, the typical industry side, which is our main thing, you know, building this kudos as a hot writing and production company. And then it, we just have stumbled into the TV world of doing the big reunion and we did the theme tune for that. The Ant and Dex Saturday Night Takeaway, we did all the music for that, we did the theme tune. Jenna Donnelly, one of our artists, sung that. And then Peter Andre, My Life, um, we did that. And now we've just this week finished doing all music for Surprise Surprise on ITV, which is starting again. So TV world's going great. We're doing a lot of business with ITV Studios and Potato, the big production company there. But um, yeah, so Audio Freaks will, I guess, is our big thing. That's our baby and that's the thing that is very hot right now and that we're going to carry on pushing. I'm very proud of all our teams. So there's one more thing to add there regarding Audio Freaks, I think, as a sign of how hot and exciting the company has become and all our teams in particular. Um, we've, we've entered into, you know, a very exciting global publishing situation. We've got a new deal in Japan with Nichion, which is like Asia's hottest publishing company. We're doing loads of business with them. And in South Korea, Vanguard Music, fairly new company, but exceptional, um, who have really got South Korea wrapped up. Asia's a very exciting market for us, we're doing a lot. Then we're with Taupa Music, who own the show The Voice, and many other shows. Um, they're a big publishing company, we're with them for mainland Europe. And then really our partners who supported us so much, and who I just think are amongst the best publishers in the world, Peer Music, who we're with the UK and the US and the rest of the world. And you know, your Richard Holly, Nigel Elderton, Sarah, all the gang there, are, um, they really feel like family for us. So yeah, that's all the O-Freaks. How did you meet your business partner, Dale? Um, Dale is, well, a dream. Uh, every single thing that's happening, I'd like to take credit for, but I just can't. It's Dale. And um, initially, um, I was managing a lot of producers, myself, and managing acts and that, and um, Dale phoned us up one day and said, uh, Matt, um, we need to talk about some publishing, and then we got into this conversation, and he was very shy. In fact, it wasn't a phone call, it was an email. He was always very shy back then, Dale. God, how times have changed. Um, and through this email, very business conversation about some publishing royalties, about a record, um, he found out that a few years prior to that, a company said that they'd got him this record deal. I was like, actually, Dale, no, that's, that's crazy. That company came to me. I was the one who got you that record deal. I said, I didn't notice you. And yeah, I got him this record deal. And he was like, oh my God, so you're the one to thank for this career that he started having as a producer. He left his job. He left Norwich Union as one of their major graphic designers to jump into music because he got this deal. So in hindsight, I've been very instrumental in, in this. And I was like, look, let's work together, join us. Like, you should, you're such a great dance producer. So amazing. And I was a massive fan of his, even though we'd lost touch for a few years. That I said, you've got to, do it man, we're in it. You know, we're running Audio Freaks now and we want you to be like our flagship producer. So he started the name Bass Monkeys, which um, over the last seven years of running Audio Freaks from day one, just like Soul Shaker, Soul Shaker and Bass Monkeys, very parallel, went on to build, become one of the bigger names in dance music production. And, um, and the first few years was just a management relationship. But, out of everyone I've ever worked with, Dale was, he was just everything I always wanted in a business partner. And, because as a manager, you can't always do great things. You can try and help. And I did some good things for him, but I felt like he could have walked away many times and gone with other bigger managers who would have done much better for him. But he never did. He always stuck with me. And um, that's who I am. I would do that for someone if I believed in the person, as opposed to the quick fix. I'm about the journey, and I think all our company are. And I saw that in Dale, and I said, Dale, I want this relationship to be more honest. I want you to become a part of the company. So he did. I gave him some shares in our whole company. 
I say that anything I say from me, I have to say me and Warren. You know, me and Warren are one. Me and Warren are one. Me and Warren are one. It's always been me and Warren in the music side of things. But I'm just speaking from myself at the moment, you know. But um, and then Dale was part of the company, and then it just he just took it by the horns, you know. I have always been the person who's worked 24 seven, slept, lived, breathed music business. I can never switch off because I feel the responsibility of everyone. And I always felt it was me chasing everyone to make sure these things were getting done. The, the one thing I always wanted was to find someone who would bloody chase me for a change, you know? And I did in Dale and um, yeah. He started chasing me. Now, aside from being an entrepreneur in music industry, you are also part of an award-winning production team called Soul Shaker, which as you mentioned before. Soul Shaker. So tell us more about that, please. Yeah, Soul Shaker is um, myself, Warren, and my one of my lifelong best friends, Gizmo. Um, and it is a, you know, I'm all about business with Dale. I had to have a creative outlet too, because I am a creative. So Soul Shaker was our creative outlet. And um, from our first record, Hypnotic Rotted Games, which went number one across the board, and um, hit top of the charts all around the world, um, did amazing business for us, and made you know, some success happen for us. Um, from that day, the Soul Shaker name always kept going in the right direction. So did Audio Freaks and everything, but from before my sort of mess up, that I had, everything was just grey. I want to say grey, it was all fun and games, but you know, it was that was the point. And Soul Shaker just always ended up building um, with loads of remixes and loads and loads of sort of, I think we involved in our 20th number one record now in the Music Week charts. And um, I guess we DJed all over the world at some of the biggest clubs in the world and, um, and won a few awards. But I think you know, this year in February we were asked to go to the Music Awards in Europe and we were presented with the Best International Dance Producer Award, which, um, you know, your Bob Sinclair and Axwell and Junior Jack and people like this have been presented with before. So that was huge for us and um, now as Soul Shaker we're doing some original productions and uh, that name's still going very, very strong. So for... Um Soul Shaker has been, you know, a pretty amazing journey, really, and um, we're still doing some pretty good stuff under that name. I like to think. I think our music's better than it's ever been, and um, we've got very big management, and we're in talks with new managers too, very big managers. So Soul Shaker's doing some really good stuff at the moment. Now, tell me more about Go Music Solutions and why you create this company. Go Music Solutions. Um, Really, the business itself was set up about 18 months ago and um, I was running it for about a year before I actually really knew that, okay, this is worthy of having its own, an own business in its own right. It was um, built out of necessity, really, that I very much felt that unsigned artists these days weren't really getting a look in and um, it's almost impossible for unsigned artists to get signed at the moment. Um, well, they can get signed, but getting signed and actually building a career in the music business, unfortunately, they really are dreaming. And um, the major labels who we need very much, who are in the music business, have at the same time made it quite difficult for unsigned artists to succeed. And the big media giants with these big TV shows, as great as they are, you know, there's this massive gap where, unfortunately, the real talent isn't rising to the top at the moment. And I felt that very much through developing our own acts and um, hitting our head, head against brick walls really, trying to get artists signed and trying to give them a career. So, you know, we ended up a few times putting together a single, a whole remix package and doing the whole national chart release. So that's, you know, employer national chart plugger and a regional radio plugger, video plugger, PR company, and doing a video, and you know, before you know it, even as an independent, you spent 50 grand doing all the chart stuff just to get to, you know, Radio One, say, 
and the head of music feels that it's not quite right for their playlist that week and so in a sense that's the end of the campaign in many ways and you're like okay I've just wasted all that money so it's a massive gamble to take spending 50 or 100 grand on a single which is not a lot of money the major labels can spend hundreds of thousands on a single um, but as an independent spending that sort of money is just just to take a gamble that it might connect at radio it's too much of a gamble to take so we had to find a new route to commercial success for these artists and my background through when I was a young whippersnapper going around the record labels was actually one of the first roles I ever did was as an independent global record broker I started building up from a very early age a network of record labels around the world where I could get record deals and I should send vinyl around the world and try and secure these deals and that's something that over 18 years now I've continued to build up and specialise in getting international record deals really. So what we do is Go Music is, it has to be based on talent. We have to believe that the artist is seriously talented. But if we do, then we'll welcome them into our company and group of companies and um, we will identify a single for them, team them up with some of our hit making producers and writers to do a single, which we have to believe is the hit single. Once we believe that, we'll get some massive name remixes together from big dance producers, often including ourselves as Soul Shaker and Bass Monkeys and other teams, and then do something that we specialise in, which is promotion. You know, we're very heavyweights at promoting records. We're constantly, almost weekly, in the charts in the Music Week official UK charts and have been for many years now. Um, and we've had stacks of number ones, loads and loads of top tens. And because um, we're very good at promoting records, working with our promotion partners. And um, once we've built up a buzz in the clubs and um, got the record really rocking, on radio too, we work with um, different radio pluggers to build up the radio. We'll often end up with 100 or 200 playlists around the world, which is great. We combine all of that ammunition and um, do a final push very hard to get it into the Music Week Club charts and the dance charts and the commercial pop charts. Um, competing against, competing against you know the major labels. So um, that's, that's the template that we follow. We build up a record, we turn it into a massive buzz record, and then we compile all the ammunition onto an EPK and use that to exploit it internationally and get record deals around the world. Is that how you promote the singles? Um, well, the promotion, you know, we've got partnerships in place. We work so closely with Tracy and Mark at Power who we do loads of stuff with and um, various other promotion companies and on top of that you know a 10,000 industry database of our own which we built up so it's just a global promotion um, that hits all of the key DJs around the world we get a buzz happening quite simply a big buzz you get lots of radio how do you do that um, just a, again established contact around the world um, you know, we normally, like I said, get well over 100 playlists on in each territory, America, UK, globally, really. So, and that all just gives us new ammunition for these unsigned artists. You know, the template is give them a big record. They go from being nobody, they come and work with us, and within a three to four month campaign, they are in the official Music Week charts and they will see their name next to David Guetta or Lady Gaga and the biggest acts in the world. We'll put them there in those official charts and then we use all that ammunition to tie up the record deals around the world, which um, we've done about 15 campaigns now. Every one of those has been in the charts and every one of them has gone on to get a global record release. Um, several of the clients we've worked with have come back several times we're now on our third campaign with so hopefully that shows how good a 
template we're using there is a very successful business model and it's something I'm very proud of because we have created this through all our work, through all the years of the contacts really, first and foremost, of being in a position where for not a lot of money, and they have to commit money, you know, we're not a charity here, we're a business, but when I say the money a client will have to put up to us is a very tiny percentage of what a major label would spend on a single release. That's the absolute truth. It's not a lot of money. We, um, the packages we put together for an unsigned artist is worth far, far more than their contribution. But it's very much a joint venture. They buy into the success of our company and how hot we are at the moment and um, we work together as a team and we give them a career. We, we, we turn them in from a nobody to someone that the music industry know and who are having a career in the music business. What about getting gigs for the acts? Well, the gigs, um, we work with most of the key agencies out there, um, but the gigs is really something that we want to work, hopefully they've got management, we want to work with their management, their PR company and give them the fuel to go off and work with the booking agents to get the gigs, you know. So if they have through us a big record blow up in the charts and they spend, you know, X amount of money on the campaigns with us, you know, a, a big record and uh, or even a big dance chart record, they could often go out there and do 10 or 20 or 30 or ho however many gigs, you know, and as the record gets bigger, a gig can go from £200 promo gig to £500 to £1,000 to £5,000 or £10,000 performing a couple of singles on a night out. So I guess, you know, the, the returns just from the gigs on our campaigns is um, can very quickly, you know, in a few gigs make their money back. And um, so they've covered their investment, hopefully. It's not our job to get them gigs, you see. It's their representatives um, to go and exploit everything we put together. We put a promotion, marketing, global release campaign together and try and get them record deals around the world and um, we give them the tools they need to, to go and build a career but we're not their managers. You know, If we were their managers we'd do the gigs and do everything else, we do what we Can do. Can you give any advice to people that you know wanted to start going into music? Um, That is a difficult question indeed, because for me it's been a long, hard road. But at the same time, I guess myself and my business partners and I think most of our teams in Audio Freaks, if not all of them, we've all come to believe that it's very much about the journey. You know, it is about the journey. And this, to me, as hard as it has been, even though the last sort of few years in particular have been amazing, you know, there was a 10, 15 year period when I wanted to hit my head against the wall most nights and cry my eyes to sleep every night. And that's the truth. It's so hard. Um, and, but now we're doing amazing. And I guess it's just tenacity. Just never give up. Because in the music business, you'll often find you're starting out on this journey with lots of other people who are like you, friends of yours, they all want to be in music. But you soon see they can't handle it. It becomes a numbers game. They fall out. They can't handle it after year one. Some might last a few years. But you know, then there's people like people around me who will never give up. And um, through never giving up, through always being tenacious in the music industry, everyone starts knowing your name because you've always been in it. And you start getting to meet everyone and the knowledge you learn through being in the business, everything just grows, you know, and it keeps growing. And um, before you know it, the success comes because people start taking you very seriously. And that's what I would say. If you want it, be prepared. But if you do want to go for it, just never give up. But goddamn, know if you're talented or not. Because if you're not, someone needs to do you the favor and say, you can't be a singer. But if you want to do music, do something else within music. So now at the end, is that any particular person that you wanted to thank? Um, well, instantly the people who jump to mind are, you know, my mum and dad. That's 
so, because without, <laughs> it's nothing. Don't start crying. <laughs> well, that's it, you know, my mum and dad, because um, they've always been there, supported us when we were young. You know, parents supporting people in the music industry, it's like, God, that is, when I look back now, that's such a leap of faith. Because the music business is, is very hard sometimes, so, you know, my mum and, and my dad, my mum worked so hard, you know, and at times it probably looked like her boys are just dossing about, joking about, DJing and doing this, and, but she, kn she now knows it was worth it, because it never was a joke. And um, my dad too, he was always there pushing us, supporting us, you know, so yeah. And also, you know, obviously, my brothers, both my brothers, Dale, Gizmo and these days the whole Audio Freaks family, 